What to make of the following? Philanthropy is enjoying a heyday. The nonprofit sector has never given away more, 316 billion in 2012, according to the Urban Institute. Meanwhile, governments in crisis and basic human services are being cut. Grid TV guest Peter Buffett thinks a lot about these topics. He's a musician and composer, but yes, he's also the son of Warren Buffett. With his wife, he heads up a foundation. But in July, he penned an op-ed with the provocative title, The Charitable Industrial Complex. And he wrote, as more lives and communities are destroyed by the system that creates vast amounts of wealth for the few, the more heroic it sounds to give back. It's what I would call conscience laundering. And that's why I wanted him and I to talk. Buffett's the author of the New York Times bestseller, Life is What You Make It. So welcome to Grit TV. Thank you so much. Great to be here. So I've called it philanthro-feudalism, but I like this uh, <laughs> charitable industrial complex. Thank what you. do you mean by it? <laughs> well, uh, you know, it's a uh, system like so many others that have sort of, uh, I guess it's grown too big for its britches or something. <laughs> and I will say britches because it's mostly men. Um, but uh, it, it really seems like it's sort of folding in on itself and, you know, keeping itself alive as opposed to trying to put itself out of business. Uh, you know, much like the military industrial complex is certainly keeping itself alive as opposed to, you know, waging peace and figuring out how to put itself out of business. So all this charitable giving isn't making any difference? Well, I would say that on, uh, you know, philanthropy, first of all, means the love of people, right? So it has nothing to do with money. So on the personal scale, on the relationship side, on the community side, there's plenty of good happening and certainly plenty of well-meaning people, but as it gets into larger sums, uh, bigger egos, <laughs> uh, bigger rooms with more people in them, uh, it starts to disconnect itself, I think, from the very issues it's, it's, it's supposedly solving or helping or whatever. All right, yeah. so let's just pull back just a second and talk about how you got into this <laughs> mess. mess. <laughs> <laughs> you said That's it. it, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, just to recap, I mean, it says on the back of the book, um, the only thing, the only inheritance you really got from your father was a philosophy. Now, is right. that really true? Well, believe it or not, it it is, it was. So, first of all, I'd like to say that I just recently became Warren Buffett's son, right? Because <laughs> nobody cared, nobody knew. Uh, the last decade has been different for me. Uh, growing up in Omaha, the house I grew up in, uh, he still lives in to this day, uh, drives himself to the same office uh, that he did in 1963. Uh, I went to the uh, same schools my mother did, went to public school all the way through, had the same English teacher my mother had in high school, so very Midwestern upbringing. Nobody did know, including me, uh, what my dad did or that there was vast amounts of money piling up. We still don't really know. No, we still don't. And, and that's true. It's, it's, a, it's a mystery, but he must be good at it, right? And um, so when I went off to college, I mean, I remember my dad literally saying, if your passion is collecting garbage, go for it. I will not love you any less than if you are a doctor. Now that's incredibly liberating and he meant it. You know, that's the other thing. I knew he wasn't just paying lip service to this or to the idea that you should find something you love. That's all I saw was that he loved what he did. Went off to college. My grandfather ended up, I learned when I was 19, leaving us uh, he left us a farm that my father sold, uh, and I got $90,000 of Berkshire Hathaway stock. And with that money, uh, I did what I thought was the smartest investment. I invested in myself. Yeah, you write about it. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah, and gave myself time to learn my craft, which was uh, music making, and uh, went on and built my career and all that. Um, yes, there were lots of, of privileges, but it was really the privilege of having the parents I had. All right, so there was the 90000 when you were 19, but then in 1999, your father starts a foundation for each of his children, and right. you're, you're one of them. Yep. And that foundation at that point, I think you say, had $10 million. That's right. The big headline came in 2006, when right. suddenly those foundations received an injection of $1 billion right. as one billion with a B. Right, with a B. <laughs> as your father started distributing his, his uh, much of his, of his fortune. Yeah. Um, talk about that, 
and how you thought about being, quote unquote, a philanthropist. Because by that point, after a lot of effort, you were actually pretty happy in the music That's world. Quite happy. You yeah, sort of exactly. found your identity. <laughs> yep. Um, yep. And then suddenly you're dealing with money again. Right. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Right. <laughs> and and it was this huge responsibility, huge opportunity, great show of trust, of course, of my dad, leaving myself and my brother and sister all a billion dollars to to do something with charitably. Um, but thank God Jennifer, my wife, was also as passionate as I was about it because I was happy in, in my music career and I didn't know what this would do to it. But we had just recently moved to New York and what we knew is it was a fantastic place to be to learn. And we spent a couple of years after 2006 really listening to a lot of people and, and probably a hundred and some people came through the office in those two years. and. It was a master class in, in the givers and the getters. You know, what's going on, who's giving and why, how do they behave, all that. And, and so that was really what we did first, is try and learn as much as we could. And that's what you argued in your op-ed in the New York Times this summer, that we need to have philanthropy doing a better job of listening. Absolutely. What's going wrong? What's the specifics of what's wrong as you see it? Well, you know, I, I, I sort of hate to say it's wrong, misguided, you know, off the tracks a little, but not because there aren't well-meaning people, but it's because you get caught up. You know, one thing, for instance, is I say that when you have a billion dollar foundation, you're better looking, your jokes are funnier, you're invited ever. So you start to get into this funhouse mirror world and you can't get to the truth as easily because the money creates a dynamic that is really disastrous for real learning and uh, so what happens also is that you know people what's better than purpose in a paycheck right I mean you're out there doing good and you're making a living and that feels good but you certainly don't get up in the morning saying how can I lose my job and that's what you should be doing and so there's all these kind of built-in mechanisms around the money not creating an honest dialogue um, the feeling that you're doing something good in the world and and paying for food on the table makes you feel good and, and you don't really want that to end. And so there's sort of these intractable problems and there's others, but those are kind of major issues around why aren't things getting better and instead just sort of keeping all these things locked in place. You know, poverty, uh, hunger, the environment, education, health, all those things are, I see them as symptoms of this larger problem of nobody really wanting to get in there and blow some things up. I mean, let's be clear, the there is a relationship between the problems that government's facing and the amount of money in philanthropic circles. I saw a piece the other day about Mark Zuckerberg of, of Facebook mm -hmm. considering how to spend his $26 billion <laughs> uh, and he wants to put it into education. Right. And the biggest amount of money going into education is coming from us, 526 billion every year from taxpayers wow, right. just for pre-K. Right. Isn't government really the most important engine of this stuff? And if the accumulation of wealth is at the cost of being able to fund government, isn't that really where we have to start? That's a tough nut to crack because, of course, then if philanthropic dollars come in, then government says, oh, maybe we don't have to worry about this so much. And then they're not doing their job because, as you're saying, they should be the ones doing it. And then at the same time, you've got people with vast amounts of money controlling government ultimately, too. So you've got this thing that circles around where you've got all sorts of money in government, you've got all sorts of money doing what government should be doing, and and people saying to government, pay attention to this as opposed to that. And and then you've got an education system in particular that is based on a, an agrarian slash industrial model that's 150 years old that shouldn't be what it is now anyway. I mean, obviously technology is slowly shifting that, and I think education 50 years from now will look very different than it does now. But you're, it gets back to this reform issue around who's responsible and, and, and how do you create the mechanisms to really make it happen? Because yeah, charitable dollars not only are throwing money into education, but then saying, oh, that didn't work so well, I'll leave. You know, and then you've got this huge hole that they've created in terms of methodology and uh, yeah. But didn't we create a system when we created graduated income tax? And you have governments that are elected with accountability to the people that decide how some of this money is spent. The philanthropists today want to not pay taxes, right. and shelter their money, but then well, control government, as Go you said, through campaign yeah, contributions. Yeah, yeah, and then play with it with charitable contributions. And yeah, the whole, 
It, um, it's a mess. Yeah, and, and it all comes down to you know the money flow and how important the importance we place on that. And of course, being my father's son, that's such a fun area to get into. And I'm, you know, there's plenty of people smarter than I am in terms of alternatives, which is some of what we find at Novo. Like, how else can we look at money flow and 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 the money role plays in our society? Because uh, it's it's distorted beyond belief. We all know that. And it's how, how do you correct those distortions? Your father's spoken up for more taxation. And tax reform. A little bit and, uh, more. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, yeah. And he's made the point of yep. the unfairness of our current tax burdens. Yep. Um, but isn't that really the point? I mean, Louis Brandeis wrote at the beginning of the century, the Supreme Court justice, last century, that you can either have this sort of concentration of extreme wealth or democracy. You can't have both. Right. And isn't our situation directly related to the fact that these fortunes have been amassed? Isn't the amassing really kind of a problem? Well, yeah. I mean, I think Ralph Nader said if we had more justice, there'd be less charity, mm -hmm. right? And that's another way of saying the same thing is that if, and that's why in the op-ed I said I'm not calling for an end to capitalism, I'm calling for humanism. Well, if you really call for humanism, you are calling for That's what I thought capitalism. when I read it. <laughs> I know. But I tried to kind of like get around that a little bit to raise the issue and say, well, what do you mean and don't you mean that? You know, I wanted to get people talking about that spot because our system, I mean, you can't have unlimited growth. You can't have, you know, the, the concept of return on investment. A lot of these definitions have to be redefined. I mean, they have to be changed so that a return is something other than you know, whatever the percentage it might be or whatever the monetary return might be. I mean, we, ha we have to really look at how we're naming things and the, the system we're in. One of the responses to your op-ed op was what really changes poverty is development. What really <laughs> forces development or incapacitates inca development is taxation. Right. You, we cannot have the sort of socially improving projects that we need, houses, schools, and all the rest of it, right. while we have so many people seeking tax havens and right. you know, right. shelters in the Caribbean or right. elsewhere. Why not make that one of your campaigns? The well, you know, that's the tricky part with me. It is complex in some senses, uh, but maybe very simple in others. But taxation may be part of it. But... I'm one of these people that think that if you're using the word reform, you're still reacting to the system that's broken, you know, whether it's education reform, tax reform. And that doesn't mean maybe in the here and now we shouldn't move a few levers and, and, and create some, uh, some different metrics and all these various things that could shift behavior. But to really shift it, I think we have to look at the, the systemic nature of this, which is why, for instance, at the foundation, we're supporting girls and women and local economies and these various things that, that I think something big has got to happen. I don't think it has to be cataclysmic or Armageddon-like, but we have to shift in a big way. And so reform to me um, is sort of a, a safe way to go about sl slow, incremental change that in the here and now, again, useful, but I don't think it's enough. 